Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of A Rabbi Cross-Examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael Skobak from Canada. 1 Thessalonians chapters 3 and 4 are happening tonight. Thank you for tuning in, and Rabbi, thank you so much for joining us as usual. I know you have a lot of things on your calendar and on your plate as it is, and we're just glad you're able to spend some time with us. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here with you. Same here. Same here for sure. For sure. Whenever, uh, we, whenever we have Canada connecting with Texas. That's big. Great things happen. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> because cause I think Canada, well, anyway, there must be some connection <clears throat> in the physical <laughs> realm. I don't know what it is. There you go. <laughs> but spiritually, we're brothers. It's it, it's happening. We we are on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, how's how have you been this week? Anyway, we usually Borough skip Kesha. the we usually skip the small talk, but I figure we should probably engage in some of it sometime or another. <laughs> <laughs> in Baruch Hashem, you know we're yeah. hanging in there. Awesome. Um, I'm I'm waiting to get out of the house one day, but hopefully that'll be sooner rather than later. Right, right. Um, yeah. But you know what? I've got a huge amount of stuff to do in the house. Oh, honeydews. And, oh, and you can't escape them. <laughs> no, I have a huge amount of stuff to do in the house. And it's, I'm, you know, I'm getting s- stuff organized and cleaned and I'm able to find things now that I didn't know that existed. It's great. It's Baruchashem. <laughs> Stuff that so, you thought you sold 30 years ago in a garage sale, you just found underneath your sofa. It's great. <laughs> it's great. But I'd Love rather it. not have to, I, I'd rather not have had this opportunity. I'd rather, <laughs> you know. I totally understand. Yeah, yes, I indeed. had my druthers. I, I prefer not to have a worldwide pandemic. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you're so right. Yeah. That's so true. Very true. Well, we're getting past it. I know. I know. Here in the states, we're actually, or at least in our uh, town areas, they're loosening up quite a bit. They're they're almost at seventy five percent capacity now, which is uh, which is a huge, uh, huge overcoming. So, Berkshire for that. You know, things are slowly getting back to normal. Yeah, look, the world should be healthy and safe, and uh, our scientists should come up with vaccines and treatments, ASAP. Right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, uh, we have a lot to do tonight. Okay, let's roll on. Let's roll on. Um, <clears throat> so, chapter 3 of First, First Thessalonians basically deals with Paul's concerns for the faith of his church that he planted there, the, the, uh, the Thessalonian church. He has concerns about their faith and how they're holding up and how they're going to be doing. And what's interesting is that this is another chapter that makes it very clear that Paul's writings are very personal letters and not divine revelation. Anyone, I believe, who reads this chapter with an unbiased eye should be able to discern that this is basically just a letter coming from Paul's heart and from Paul's personal concerns. And it's nothing more than that. This is not, you know, and and the Lord spoke unto Paul saying, uh, there's not even a clue or a hint that this chapter was revealed to Paul by God. And I believe it carries through in the rest of his writings. But there are certain places where it's just imminently clear that what we have here in front of us is a personal letter, personal correspondence. And... I only have a few things to share about chapter three. There's not much really to discuss. Um, but in verses three to four, Paul warns the church to expect persecution and affliction. And the NAS, NASB study Bible writes that difficulties are to be expected in the Christian life. They say that the scripture teaches that those who live godly lives should expect persecution. Now, again, you know, we've seen so many times in the past weeks that uh, they try to make a mountain out of a molehill in terms of what they believe is relevant to advancing the Christian case. Um, You know, certain things that they say prove truth. Um, but obviously don't. You know, the fact, for example, that Paul 
was able to, uh, you know, not charge for his teaching, you know, that doesn't prove that Paul is teaching the truth, you know, and th there are many things that they try to point out, the commentaries, uh, you know, as again, indicating the truth of the Christian faith, but none of these things is relevant. And the same thing here, the truth is that virtually all uh, religious groups in the world have faced persecution from some quarter. Uh, it's very rare to find any religion that has not faced persecution. So when, when the NASB, NASB study Bible here says that those who live godly lives should expect persecution, um, that doesn't prove that the church is living godly lives or that the church has the truth. Persecution obviously does not prove that those that are persecuted are living godly lives, and it doesn't prove that those that are persecuted uh, have the truth. And so, again, you know, it could be that Paul is right in assuming that the church is going to be persecuted. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I seem to suspect is that Paul himself faced a lot of persecution because he was probably an annoying person, and <laughs> no one likes to be hounded by annoying people. And so he probably, you know, got what he deserved in many cases. Um, maybe sometimes it was unprovoked what he got. But again, the fact that someone is getting beat up doesn't prove that their cause is just. There are plenty of people who get beat up and their cause is unjust. And in, in verses five to eight, Paul was concerned. He expresses his concern in this chapter that the Thessalonians might succumb to the temptations of Satan and abandon their Christian faith. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting is that we have several places in the Christian Bible where we're taught that the entire purpose of Jesus coming was to defeat Satan. For example, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 14, it writes that Jesus died to render powerless the devil, meaning to make the devil powerless. Or in 1 John chapter 3, verses 8 to 9, they write that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So the way the Christian Bible touts Jesus is that he came and he died in order to destroy the power, the works of the devil. And yet we see here that um, Satan was operating with his full powers, even to the extent where he could potentially lead people away from their faith. And we saw the same thing last time we met in chapter 2, verse 18, where Paul says that his travel plans were hindered by Satan. So clearly, um, you know, since Satan seems to have so much power uh, and ability to disrail, derail Christians, both physically and spiritually, it doesn't seem that Jesus' death really accomplished anything in this regard. Now, that's really all I had to share on chapter 3. So the bulk of what we'll do in this session is First Thessalonians chapter 4. And there's quite a bit here to get our teeth into. In verse 1, and verse 1 has something that we've seen numerous times before. It's where Paul distinguishes between Jesus and God. And it, it's pretty clear that if Paul really believed that Jesus was God, he could have been infinitely clearer and said this explicitly. Now, here's what he says in the beginning of chapter 4. He says, finally, brethren, we request, we request and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you learned from us how you ought to live and to please God. So he's distinguishing here between Jesus and God. And uh, again, this is something we've seen numerous times. Uh, virtually every time that, that Paul speaks about Jesus, he speaks about him as uh, distinguished from God, not identical with God. And what Paul does here is to use the expression that they should please God. They should live their lives in a way that is pleasing to God. And what's interesting is that Paul uses this expression 
32 times, according to at least one count uh, in the Christian Bible, in his writings, Paul speaks 32 times about pleasing God. And the question I'd like to just raise is, what exactly is pleasing to God? When Paul says to people that you should live a life that's pleasing to God, how exactly do you do that? Now, we know what is pleasing to God because God made his will clear to us in the Torah. I mean, that's basically the word Torah itself means instructions. And so God's purpose in giving us the Torah, giving us his instructions, was to let us know what would be pleasing to him from us, meaning how we could follow his instructions and live a life that's pleasing to God. Um, And so we don't need Paul's ramblings to tell us how to be pleasing to God. God already revealed to us how we can do that. It's by following his will. And the Torah literature goes beyond this, meaning beyond actually following God's instructions, our Torah literature, Torah sages say that we should be going beyond the letter of the law, not just following the law, not just following the Torah, but going beyond the letter of the law. Um, This too is pleasing to God. I mean, the truth is that um, our sages actually say something dramatic in the Talmud, in, in Tractate Baba Metzia, page 30, you know, they asked the question, why was Jerusalem destroyed? And the answer, one of the answers the Talmud gives is because they followed the Torah. Now, you look at that and you say, what's wrong with that? I, I would think that that was a good thing. And the Talmud says, no, they only followed the law. They did not go beyond the letter of the law. Because the truth is that when someone has an attitude that I'm only willing to do what is required of me, that's a lousy attitude. If a person shows up at work the first day and says to the boss, look, I'm willing to come here at nine in the morning. Uh, I'm willing to do everything on my job description, but don't even dream about asking me to stay here one minute after five o'clock. Don't even dream about asking me to do anything that's not explicitly in my job description. That's a recipe for disaster. Or if a person gets married on the wedding day, says to his wife, you know, dear, I love you very much. I'm willing to fulfill all of the obligations written in our marriage contract, but don't even dream about asking me or expecting me to do anything that's not spelled out in the marriage contract. That's a recipe for a horrible marriage, for disaster. So the Torah, the law, basically gives us what is a bottom line you know, what you should never, God forbid, fall beneath. But ideally, people should try to anticipate, okay, now that I know what God's uh, bottom line is, how can I go beyond that and live a life that's truly pleasing to him? And that's the idea of not just following the Torah, but going beyond the letter of the law. And so we don't need Paul to preach to us about living a life that's pleasing to God. We already have from the Torah and from total literature, uh, the recipe for how to live a life that's pleasing to God. And what's interesting that in verse two here, um, and in verse eight, by the way, he repeats this in verse eight as well, Paul stresses the idea that the authority of his instructions are not his own, but he emphasizes that they come from Jesus. And again, we've pointed this out countless times, that this is simply an assertion a claim that Paul is making. He's simply claiming that Jesus spoke to him and Jesus revealed things to him. There's no proof to this. And any of the people in his audience would have rightly been skeptical. They would rightly have expected some kind of evidence, proof, corroboration. How do we know that what you're telling us is by the word of Jesus? How do we know that you actually heard from Jesus? There's no witnesses, there's no evidence. It's simply Paul's claim, and that's a very, very weak foundation. Uh, you know, just simply person claiming that they're a prophet does not in itself make them a prophet. A person's claim can be very self-serving, and it's not beyond the uh, question. It's not beyond the possibility that everything that Paul's teaching is things that he's made up, and that when he believes in his own heart that God spoke to him or that Jesus spoke to him, 
he's basically doing what many Christians do today is that they take their own feelings and their own intuitions and their own thoughts and they stamp those thoughts with the claim that it's from the Holy Spirit. So it's very easy to do that. It's very easy for a person to say today, God spoke to me and said I should plant a church in Wyoming. Well, probably what happened is the person had their own imagination leading them in that direction, and they just assumed that it must have been the Holy Spirit leading them there. So Paul, again, just simply makes this claim that has no corroboration, no evidence, no proof. Going on in verse 3, Paul teaches the Thessalonians that God's will is that they should be holy. They should be holy. And again, we don't need Paul to come and teach us this idea because this was already taught to us directly by God. You know, (laughs) why does Paul have to tell us something that God already taught? In Leviticus chapter 19, God said, Kadoshim tihiyu ki kadosh ani. You shall be holy, God says, as I, God, am holy. You should be holy as I, God, am holy. And this is really the Torah's, this is God's directive about how to bridge the gap between himself, between God and infinite spiritual being and human beings and earthly physical human beings. It would seem that this gap is unbridgeable. How do you bridge this gap? And God tells us in the Torah a number of times, God says, you shall be holy like I am holy. He says something similar in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 9. He said, the Torah says, V'halachta bidrachav, you shall walk in his ways, meaning you should imitate God. The Talmud says, like, just as God is merciful, you should be merciful. Just as God is kind, you should be kind. Just as God is generous, you should be generous, etc. Just as God is forgiving, you should be forgiving. And so the Torah teaches us that we can get close to God, we can bridge the gap between God and ourselves by us becoming more godly. That's what God says, you shall be holy like I am holy. You shall walk in my ways. And that's the recipe of the Torah. The Torah speaks about human beings becoming more godly. What the Torah never says is that this gap will be bridged by God becoming more human meaning that by God taking on human form and the Christian doctrine of the incarnation, that's definitely not the path to bridging the gap that the Torah ever speaks about. Torah has a very different point of view. Torah says, yes, you shall be holy, God says to us, as I, God, am holy. And he continues in verse 3, Paul says that you should abstain from sexual immorality. And he's a little bit vague here about what exactly this means. What does it mean to abstain from sexual immorality? Um, So there are other places in his writings where Paul uh, elaborates in terms of what he means. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says that there should be no sex outside of marriage. He abhors, um, you know, harlotry in Romans chapter 1. He speaks out against homosexuality, as he speaks about a number of times in his writings uh, in Hebrew, uh, sorry, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 4, he speaks about um, not having lewd speech or lewd joking. Um, That's more or less all Paul really says about abstaining from sexual immorality. But he doesn't go much further. And he doesn't really help us understand what exactly is entailed in avoiding sexual immorality. Um, For example, in the Torah, the Torah doesn't only prohibit sexual intercourse with certain people. The Torah uh, wants us to know that we should avoid things that might lead to that. So, for example, the Torah speaks about, you know, not approaching, not coming close to people that we cannot have intercourse with, which is defined as not having any, uh, you know, erotic contact with them. Let's say hugging and kissing would be forbidden. 
um, the, the Torah law prohibits something called yichud, being, uh, con- being confined into a private place where people don't have access, meaning being alone with someone, let's say, in a locked room or a locked house, um, even if you don't touch them, the Torah prohibits that because it could very easily lead to uh, pro- uh, the violating the prohibition against sleeping with these people that were prohibited from sleeping with. And so when Paul just throws out this general category of abstain from sexual immorality, he doesn't really help his audience in terms of understanding what exactly are the parameters. How do you abstain from sexual immorality? Um, what's the practical advice? And it seems that for Paul, he lets each person set the bar where they feel is appropriate for themselves. Uh, the Torah has a very different point of view. Um, in verse 5, Paul takes a swipe at non-Jews. He says that Gentiles do not know God. Um, this is a really unfortunate and unfair generalization, and it's simply not true. Um, for example, anyone that would read the book of Genesis, um, this is even before there are Jews. Everyone is basically uh, Gentile, if you will, or Noahide. Um, there are no Jews per se in the book of Genesis. There are people who will become the Jewish people, but there's no Judaism. There's no Torah. Uh, there's no that doesn't happen until the Jews receive until the Israelites receive the Torah at Mount Sinai. So we see in the book of Genesis, there are people who know God, they walk with God, they have a relationship with God, they live righteously before God. Um, How could you say that Gentiles do not know God? Or in the book of Jonah, we see that the whole city of Nineveh takes God very seriously. Um, when, When Jonah warns them that God is angry and God might destroy them, they're obedient and they repent. Uh, it, I, I don't think I would say that the people in Nineveh didn't know God. Uh, Ruth, who is not Jewish, obviously knew God, and she decided that she wanted to follow God as the Jewish people do, and she embraces the path of the Jewish people. But before her embrace of Torah and Judaism, she clearly was someone who knew God. And then in the, the first century, where Paul is writing, we know that there were thousands and thousands, some people estimate a hundred thousand, what we call Yire Elohim, God-fearers. So there were plenty of Gentiles in the days of Paul who knew God. And it's it's unfortunate that Paul here makes this sweeping generalization that Gentiles do not know God. Moving on to verse 8, it says, Paul says that God gives us his Holy Spirit. Now, there's not really a lot for me to say about that verse, but I wanted to comment on a um, commentary that I saw from the ESV study Bible. Um, And they write the following on this passage that God gives us his Holy Spirit. So the ESV study Bible says, in the Old Testament, God promised that he would establish a new covenant in which the Holy Spirit would write the law on people's hearts and cause them to obey this new covenant reality, which has been inaugurated by the Messiah. Now, I found this comment to be wildly, wildly inaccurate. Uh, Let's go through a few of the problems. First of all, the new covenant is spoken of, as we know, in Jeremiah chapter 31. That's the passage in the Tanakh that speaks about the Brit Chadasha, the Brit Chadasha, the new covenant or the renewed covenant. And if you read that passage in Jeremiah, there's absolutely nothing in there about the Holy Spirit writing the Torah on our hearts. Um, It doesn't speak about that. It speaks about God himself, the Yudke Vavke, the Tetragrammaton, that will do this. That's who's speaking in that chapter. Hashem will do it himself, not through the agency of his Holy Spirit. Um, So this comment by the ESV study Bible is just inaccurate. Um, It's also interesting that he applies it to the Thessalonian church, but it's clear that in Jeremiah, he says that God is making this new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Um, He doesn't include there uh, 
uh, non-Jews, Gentiles. A second problem with this comment in the ESV study Bible is that if you read Jeremiah chapter 31, it's very clear that the new covenant that he speaks of has not yet been made. It hasn't happened yet. A few reasons. Number one, it speaks about God writing the Torah in our hearts, having the Torah in our hearts. What does that mean to have the Torah in your heart? So it means that we'll be obedient to follow the Torah. For example, in Psalm 40, David writes, I delight to do your will, my God, because your Torah is within my heart. Meaning when you have the Torah in your heart, it means you'll do it. We see parallel uh, passages in Ezekiel chapter 11 and in Ezekiel chapter 36, where the prophet writes about God transforming our hearts from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And the prophet Ezekiel says in these chapters that when God transforms our hearts, we will keep and obey all the commandments. And so if that's what it means that the new covenant will be one in which God writes the Torah in our hearts, and that means we will all be obedient to follow the Torah and to keep the Torah, this clearly hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, we're living in an age where maybe 20% of the Jewish people are Torah observant. And so it's impossible to say that this covenant that God promised to make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah has happened yet. Also, Jeremiah says in this chapter, in chapter 31, that when the new covenant is made, he says that there'll be no need to teach anyone to know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. And this obviously has not happened. We don't live in a world since the times of Jeremiah where the entire world knows God. It happens to be one of the prophecies about the messianic age, that in the times of the Messiah, we're told, everyone in the world will know God. As Isaiah says, that the knowledge of God will be as widespread as the waters that cover the ocean beds. Or as Zechariah says, in that day, the Lord will be one and his name will be one. But that hasn't happened yet. And so it's very clear, anyone that reads Jeremiah 31 will obviously realize that it simply has not happened yet, despite the fact that the ESV Study Bible claims that it was inaugurated by Jesus. Moving on to verse 11, this now, this verse will now bring us um, to the main concern of this chapter. Um, we titled the program tonight, The Rapture, and that's going to be the focus of the coming verses. Um, apparently, there was a widespread expectation at that time that Jesus would return imminently. And as a result, some people uh, in the Thessalonian church stopped working. You know, they figured, look, if Jesus is coming back soon and we're all going, all going to heaven, you know, who needs to work? And so there were many people who stopped working and they let others support them. So Paul reproves them here in verse 11. And apparently it wasn't successful, meaning whatever Paul tried to help here by, by preaching to these people didn't really improve anything because this topic again is brought up later in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 to 15. Paul has to go on to another rant about the importance of working. So it's interesting that we all know that when uh, this sort of millennial fever grips people, uh, the normal order of society breaks down. For example, um, around the first century, probably a little bit prior, the Essenes uh, was a group that assumed that the end times were upon them. And so the Essenes stopped getting married and they, you know, they lived communally. They said, who needs to make a lot of money? And, you know, the normal order broke down. And uh, it's interesting mm -hmm. that you find remnants of this. There were people who thought actually that Paul and Jesus may have been somehow connected to these scenes, but even if they weren't, you see that both Paul and Jesus don't get married. You see that in the gospels, there is, you know, there, there is uh, times when Jesus speaks about living communally, sharing all your property. So there is a normal, there's a breakdown. If people feel the world is coming to an end and we're all going to go to heaven tomorrow. So, 
you know, a, a lot of the things that we would normally engage in, people stop engaging in. And Paul was concerned about this. Maybe Paul was more realistic. And he didn't know for sure that Jesus was going to be returning, you know, so imminently. So he tells them in verse 11 that, no, it's very important to work. Now, what, what also I wanted to look at in verse 11, I'm sorry, in verse 13, a few verses later, was that there was this widespread expectation that Jesus would return soon. And because of that, there was apparently lots of concern uh, among some people in the Thessalonian church regarding those Christian friends and relatives that had passed away, that had died, or that will pass away before Jesus returns. They thought it was going to happen very soon. So there could have been, you know, someone's grandfather about to pass away, and there were people who were concerned, oh, what if this, you know, my grandfather, whatever, dies, you know, when Jesus comes tomorrow? Um, you know, there was a concern that will these people who passed away in some way miss out and be deprived of the blessings that will result from the second coming of Jesus when Jesus returns. There was a consternation and concern in the church. I'll just tell you an interesting story, um, similar story that happened to me a number of years ago. Uh, I received a email from someone, uh, you know, living in, you know, in a very rural part of Canada that said they were reading the Bible and they were reading about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they were curious. And we started to communicate by, by, via email. And I explained, you know, that there's in Judaism, there's a belief that not everyone has to be Jewish and you could follow the universal laws of morality that were revealed by God to Adam and to Noah. It's called the Noahide path. And we spoke about this for a number of weeks until the person said to me, you know, I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested really in exploring Judaism. So again, we exchanged emails for weeks about Judaism, and I can tell the person was very, very interested in, in possibly becoming a Jew. And I, I said to the person, did you ever meet a Jew in your life? And the, she said to me, no, I never met a Jew. Um, person was living on some goat farm in the middle of nowhere. And so I said, well, would you like to? And, and I knew people that lived, you know, uh, Torah observant uh, families that lived not far from her. And uh, I arranged for her to go there for Shabbat. And she took to it like a fish to water. And she kept on going back every week. And um, it was very clear that she was on her path to conversion. And uh, I think about a year later, there was a family that had lived in that town that had moved to Israel, and the, the 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 husband of the family was studying full time in a yeshiva, full time in a kollel, and they they met this girl. They were very taken with her, and uh, she ended up moving in with them in Israel. And I lost touch with her at that point. And then about a year or two later, I got a phone call from this girl. She must have been by this time in her early twenties, and uh, she. I wasn't home when she called, so she left me a message. Can you please call me back? And I called her back, but she wasn't home. But the the man of the house was the the, the 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 was there, and he answered the phone, and he said, "Look, she probably won't mind if I tell you why she was calling. She was calling to let you know that she finished her conversion, and that she got engaged." And I said, "Wow!" I said, "When is she getting married?" He said, she's getting married in June. I forget the date now, June 22nd. I said, you know what? I'm going to be in Israel then. He said, well, come to the wedding, which I did. It was quite mind blowing. But then before he hung up, he said to me, look, Rabbi Skobak, I want to tell you something about this young woman that you helped send here to be with us in Israel. He said to me that she converted with the top baiting, the top rabbinical court in Jerusalem, the most stringent most difficult rabbinical court. And she said that when she emerged from the mikvah, from the ritual bath at the end of the conversion process, she thanked the three judges, the three rabbis on the rabbinical court. And they thought that she was thanking them for converting her. And she said, no, I'm not thanking you for converting me. So they wanted to know, why are you thanking us? And she said, I'm thanking you 
because now I can finally pray with all of my heart for the Messiah to come. And they were shocked. They said, you mean you've not been praying for that? And she said, well, I really couldn't pray for that with all my heart. I mean, sure, I, play, I prayed for the Messiah to come, but I couldn't do it with all my heart. Because she said to the rabbi, as you know, that according to Torah teaching, at least according to some teachings in the Torah, when the Messiah comes, the, the rabbinical courts will no longer accept converts. Um, I guess it'll be too tempting, too, you know, uh, you know, it'll be too attractive for people to want to be part of the Jewish people at that point. So there was a concern in the same way. I don't think they accepted converts in the days of Solomon for that reason, because at that time of Solomon, the Jews are the top of the world and they, they felt that people would want to convert so they can get on, on a good deal. And so the sages teach us that when the Messiah comes, they're not going to accept converts. And this woman told, this young woman told the rabbis, look, I was concerned that if I prayed for all my heart for the Messiah to come and he showed up before I finished my conversion, I couldn't become a Jew. And she said, I wanted so deeply and so badly to become a Jew. I had a hard time praying with all my heart for the Messiah to come. But now, thank God that I finished my conversion I want to thank you because now I can pray with all of my heart for the Messiah to come. So I felt it was sort of similar to what these people in the Thessalonian church were concerned about, that if the Messiah shows up, if Jesus comes and, you know, their relatives have passed away, maybe they're going to miss out for some reason. So Paul goes on to reassure them in this chapter, don't worry, that he says to them in the same way that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, so to your, your relatives and your other people that you're concerned about, they'll also be resurrected. Um, I'm not going to spend so much time on that particular issue. Now, in verse 13, David Stern has a, as we know, David Stern has a messianic Jewish commentary to the Christian Bible. And here he insists that there's really nothing to be said about when someone dies. There's nothing to be said about in death because he says that believing Christians will be going to be with Jesus after they die. And what Stern does, I found this fascinating, is that he contrasts Paul's certainty of his glorious ultimate reward. You see this, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, where Paul speaks about his certainty that he's going to be rewarded with a blissful experience in heaven. And so David Stern contrasts Paul's certainty of his glorious ultimate reward with what he, David Stern, calls Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai's pitiful, or pitiable, he says, pitiable deathbed confession. Now, it's a long passage, but I, I want to read it because it's fascinating how David Stern takes this passage. So this is a passage in Tractate Brachot, 28b. I believe it's 28b. And it's it, it's basically talking about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was basically one of the greatest rabbinic sages, his last words. So it says, when Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai became ill, his students came to visit him. When he saw them, he began to cry. His students said to him, Rabbi, lamp of Israel, the light pillar, he said, he, they say, you're a mighty hammer. Why are you crying? He replied, if they were taking me before a human king who is here today and tomorrow is in the grave, who may become angry with me, but whose anger will not last forever, who may imprison me, but whose imprisonment is not forever, who may put me to death, but not to everlasting death, and whom I can appease with words and bribe with money, nevertheless, I'd be crying. But now that I'm about to be taken before the king who reigns over kings, the Holy One, blessed be he who lives and endures forever and ever. If he is angry with me, his anger lasts forever. If he imprisons me, his imprisonment is eternal. If he puts me to death, it's an eternal death. And whom I cannot appease with words or bribe with money. Shouldn't I cry? And that's not all. When there are two roads in front of me, one leading to heaven, to Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, and the other to Gehenna, to hell, 
and I don't know which road are they going to take me. Shouldn't I cry? And they said to him, Rabbi, please bless us. And he said to them, may it be God's will that your fear of God should be as great as your fear of flesh and blood. His students said to him, is that all? Meaning that we should be afraid of God as much as we're afraid of other human beings? Doesn't seem like that's enough. And he said to them, I wish you would at least be able to attain that. And I'll prove it to you, he said to them. If a person commits a sin, he says, I hope that no one sees me. But he's not afraid that God watches him, which proves that his fear of man is stronger than his fear of God. When he was about to die, he said to his students, clear out the vessels so that they should not become unclean, ritually unclean, since vessels in the house with a dead body become ritually unclean. And prepare a chair for Hezekiah, the king of Judah, who is coming to accompany me to heaven. So David Stern says, isn't this pitiable that here this great, great, great rabbi, he says he doesn't know if he's going to Gan Eden, to heaven, or he's going to Gehenom. And he says, isn't that pitiable compared to Paul? Paul, he says, was certain that he's going to be um, in heaven with God. Now, it's clear from the context of this passage that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, in all likelihood, believed that he would ultimately achieve the bliss of the world to come. He wasn't unaware of how righteous he was. He wasn't unaware that he was the most righteous person of his generation. Um, if you just simply read the previous paragraph, um, you know, his students asked him how they can be assured of eternal life, meaning that, you know, right before he expresses to them that he's uncertain about his faith, his fate. So they ask him um, when Rabbi, no, I'm sorry, that was <laughs> another rabbi. I made a mistake. Um, but, but it's clear that the, the great rabbis, um, you know, th they didn't think it was impossible for righteous people, normal people, to have a share in the world to come because obviously, Rav Yochanan ben Zakkai was certainly aware of the teaching of the Mishnah, that Kol Yisrael yesh lahem chelek l'olam haba, that all of Israel has a share in the world to come. He wasn't unaware of this. But what we have here in this story that I read were his reflections on his deathbed. Imagine this is a great, great, great sage, a righteous sage, that it, he's on his deathbed. And he is trying to make an impression on the students that came. He's not really revealing so much to us about, um, you know, what's going to happen to himself. But he's trying to make a point to the students to help them realize that in life the stakes are very high. And while probably not fearing for the fate of he wasn't afraid that he was going to have the same fate as people who were ultimately wicked. Meaning that, you know, when you read the story at face value, it sounds like he's afraid that he's going to have the same fate as people who are thoroughly wicked. It's, it's very unlikely that he really believed that about himself. But he wondered, however, this is probably what he was wondering about, if perhaps his soul would have to be purified in Gehenna. You see, in the Torah, Gehenna is different than the Christian idea of hell. The Christian, at least the Protestant view of hell, is that it's a place of eternal punishment. And the idea that he's speaking about, Gehenna, is basically limited to about a maximum of 12 months. And it's essentially an experience for the soul to be purified, it's like a, it's like going to a hospital, going to a spiritual dry cleaner, and people that have certain sins or in spiritual impurities from their life that they weren't able to completely remove through repentance, they would have to go through this period 
of spiritual dry cleaning, of spiritual cleansing in Gehenom. And he didn't know if he would have to have that kind of experience. I'm sure that Rav Yochanan ben Zakkai, during the moments before he was dying, and even before that, was engaging in repentance. So it's quite possible that he did repent of everything. But we know that the righteous are held to a higher standard, what we call noblesse oblige. And even for uh, things that normal people would not be responsible for at all, great people will be highly held highly responsible. So he's basically saying that, look, I'm aware of who I am. He wasn't unaware of his greatness. And because of his greatness, he just didn't know for sure that he would be able to move ultimately to the world to come, to eternal bliss, without having to spend a certain amount of time in this Gehenom to get his soul purified. Um, you know, there's a beautiful story that I often tell that on the high holidays, on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, so there's a custom that many people have of Tashlich, of where they go to a body of water, to a river usually, and they take, you know, pieces of bread or whatever, they throw it into the river, and so symbolically, they're throwing away their sins. And usually the whole town goes down together. So one year, the whole town went down to this river, and they were throwing away their sins symbolically, and then they headed back to town. And on the way back to town, there was some person who was passing them, going in the other direction down to the river. Now, the, the group was led that had been led, actually, he left already, there was a great Rebbe that was the spiritual leader of the town. And when he ran into the people that were sort of the last coming back into the city, they said, what are you doing? You know, we've already did, every, we, we, already, we did Shashlik already. And this fellow says, oh no, I'm going down to the river to pick up the sins of the Rebbe. Meaning that he recognized that, you know, when you think about it, what were the sins of the Rebbe? So maybe for the Rebbe, the sin was that when he gave charity, he didn't do it with a thousand percent enthusiasm. Maybe it was only 999 percent. And so that little tiny, you know, smidgen of lack of enthusiasm for the Rebbe might have been a sin. For most of us, we would be applauded if we were able to give charity the way the Rebbe gave charity. You know, when the, the Rebbe prayed, you know, maybe he wasn't uh, concentrating enough in his prayers. Maybe he wasn't uh, concentrating a thousand percent. Maybe there was one millimeter of his mind that wasn't focused on the prayer. For most of us, that would be amazing, to, you know, to, to reach 99 percent concentration. But the Rebbe, that was a failure. So this person was acknowledging that, look, everyone's throwing away their sins. I'm going down to the river to pick up the sins of the Rebbe, because for me, those would be amazing if I was able to have those. So what happens here is that Paul is comparing himself. I'm sorry, David Stern. David Stern here is comparing Paul to Rav Yochan and Ben Zakkai. And I would ask the question, if you're looking at two people, who is more likely to think that they are okay? Who is more likely to believe that they are destined for heaven? Right? If you speak to two people, let's say one of them is good and one of them is bad, two different people, one is good, one is bad, and you ask them, are you good? So which one of them is more likely to say that they're good, the good one or the bad one? So the truth is that the person that's more likely to think they're good is the bad person. The really good person probably thinks to himself, you know, I could have been better. I could have done much better. And that's the, the you know, the famous story of Rav Zisha, Rav Zisha of Anapoli, that on his deathbed, he was a great, great righteous person in his generation, a Hasidic master. And he was crying on his deathbed. And the students couldn't figure out why is he crying? If anyone is destined to go straight to heaven, it's Reb, the Rebbe, Rav Zisha. And so they said, maybe you're afraid that when you go up to heaven, they're going to ask you, why weren't you as great as Moses? Or maybe you're afraid that when you go to heaven, they're going to ask you why you weren't as great as Rabbi Akiva. And he says, no, I'm not afraid of those questions because I have perfectly good answers. 
If they ask me why weren't you as great as Moses or Rabbi Akiva, I have a very simple answer. I wasn't born with the, with the abilities and the talents and the proclivities and the spiritual abilities of Moses or Rabbi Akiva. But there's one question that they're going to ask me in heaven that I'm terrified of because I don't have any good answer. And they're going to say, Zisha, why weren't you Zisha? Why weren't you the person that you could have become? And so a truly great person isn't a thousand percent confident that they accomplished everything they could accomplish in life. A truly humble person is someone who has self-doubts because they wonder, you know, I probably could have been better. And so when Paul here uh, expresses his total certainty that he's going to be in heaven, and David Stern says, isn't Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai pitiable, sad, pathetic, because he's not certain that he's going to heaven, I would say, I don't see it like that. I would say that, you know, if you see two people and one of them is certain that, you know, their future is perfect and one of them is not certain, I would say one of them is certainly more humble. One of them is certainly um, more realistic. And I think one of the great dangers of Paul's attitude is that when a person goes through their life and they reach a stage, according to Christianity, this is when you accept Jesus into your heart, when a person reaches a stage where they can feel, I now have a guaranteed place in heaven. No matter what I do, Jesus forgives all my sins, past, present, and future. I think the great danger there is that it can easily breed a moral and spiritual complacency which is very unfortunate. Okay, let's try to finish up now. Um, verse 17 discusses what many Christians refer to as the rapture. And the critical word here in Greek is harpazo. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O, which means to snatch or take away suddenly. And the passage is actually quite vague about exactly who it is that's going to be raptured who's going to be raptured up into the sky to meet Jesus when he supposedly will appear, and then what happens next. So here you have this idea of a rapture, but it's very unclear as to, again, who is going to be raptured and what happens to them. For example, the Reformation Study Bible says, we're not told whether those raptured will descend back to earth with Jesus or return to heaven with him. So there are various views among different Christian groups about what actually will happen during the rapture. And many Christians simply believe that this passage in 1 Thessalonians is describing the so-called second coming of Jesus. And some believe that after whisking away Christians from the world to return to heaven, it'll be in order to escape the tribulation, either to escape all seven years of the tribulation, according to some, or three and a half years of the tribulation, according to others. And then they believe that Jesus will return after the tribulation for the actual second coming and the millennial kingdom. Now, we're not going to get involved into this internal Christian issue tonight. I just wanted to conclude by reflecting a little bit on this doctrine of the second coming. It's very clear that the Thessalonians, many of them, were certain that Jesus was going to return soon. Now, it's interesting that um, the when Jesus died, it and he died without fulfilling any of the messianic prophecies, it caused tremendous um, cognitive dissonance among the early Christians, among the early followers of Jesus. Now, when we say that Jesus did not fulfill any of the messianic prophecies, what exactly are the real messianic prophecies? So I would say they're the ones that are so clear that all Jews and all Christians agree that they're messianic, like Isaiah chapter 2 or Isaiah chapter 11. Now, Jesus did not fulfill any of these. So in order to resolve their cognitive dissonance and the fact that Jesus didn't fulfill any of these prophecies, what they invented was a messianic installment plan and insisted that Jesus would fulfill these prophecies at his second coming. 
And they then generated dozens of bogus messianic prophecies, allegedly prophesying his first advent. Now, it's important to remember the following, that number one, the Tanakh never speaks of the Messiah coming and not completing his mission and having to return. This is a totally non-biblical fabrication. Number two, it's obviously a rationalization that can be claimed for any failed Messiah, meaning that any person or any group who believes that someone is the Messiah and that person fails and dies and doesn't fulfill any of the prophecies, you can always claim for any failed Messiah, don't worry, when they come back, they'll fulfill all of the prophecies. Number three, if this were true, meaning if it was supposed to be true that the Messiah would come back a second time to fulfill all of the messianic, the real messianic prophecies, then these prophecies should speak about the Messiah returning. If you were to read all of the real messianic prophecies in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 11, Ezekiel chapter 37, etc., Jeremiah chapter 23, none of them speak about this person returning to fulfill these prophecies. They speak with a first coming perspective. Number four is if you look at Isaiah chapter 42, verse four, it seems to teach very clearly that the Messiah would not fail in completing his mission uh, and require a second coming. It seems to be an explicit verse that refutes the idea of a second coming. Now, 1 Thessalonians was one of the first books that were written by Paul. He wrote it around the year 55. Now, if Jesus dies in the year 30, we're talking now about 25 years after the death of Jesus. What happened was that the gospel writers put into Jesus' mouth various predictions of his return. I don't believe Jesus expected to die before he fulfilled his mission, but the gospel writers put into his mouth predictions, for example, in Mark chapter 13, verse 30, where Jesus allegedly says, truly I say to you that this generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. Or in Matthew chapter 16, verse 28, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here today who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So there was an expectation among many of the early Christians that before a generation passes, Jesus has to return. And now we're talking about 25 years after the crucifixion. It's the year 55. And now Paul probably is hearing people murmuring, like, what's going on? Where is Jesus? And to a great extent, he writes to the Thessalonians in response to uh, the people who are clamoring to have more information about what happened to Jesus. Um, so with, with that, we'll end for tonight. And uh, I will wish you, William, uh, an awesome week and all of the viewers also an awesome week. And hopefully, God willing, next week we'll conclude First Thessalonians uh, with chapter five. Awesome. Sounds like a good plan. Or about thank you for your time. And uh, always a pleasure having you here almost in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have a great week, Rabbi, you as well. And uh, Hashem willing, we'll see you guys same time, same place. And uh, until then, y'all have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbat Tov. And I've got one more show coming up. So tune in in about 30 minutes. We'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom.